So, boa noite, everybody. Uh, buenas noches. Hello and be very welcome. My name is Lili Vieira de Carvalho. I'm the executive director of LAC, the Vancouver Latin American Cultural Center. And I will be your host for tonight. My colleague Angela is also working on this event and she'll be making sure that everything uh, runs smoothly. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are hosting this event from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tisleawatut peoples. And I want to encourage you all to read and understand the history of this land and the people who have taken care of it for thousands of years. And uh, Angel is going to share on the chat this um, resource that we think is really interesting uh, because if you are joining us from another part of the country or another part of the world, there is an excellent uh, uh, link uh, so you can learn about the land uh, where you live. So VLAC is a nonprofit organization with the mandate of sharing a deeper understanding of Latin American arts and cultures. Our goal is to establish the first cultural center for Latin American arts in Canada right here in Vancouver. If you still don't know about VLAC, uh, please visit our website. Uh, Angela will add the link to the chat. We, we have added, when, when you register for this event, we added your email to our newsletter list, which you can always uh, um, unsubscribe if you wish. But I just wanted you to know that we send monthly newsletters that has uh, with the list of all our programs of the month. So we won't overbear you with too, uh, too many e emails, but it's a great a way of keeping in touch with us and knowing about the programs we run. So tonight's format will be quite simple. Uh, Jairo will give a around 50 minute presentation. And then at the end, we will open up the floor for, to questions from the audience. So as you listen to this event, if you have a great question that you would like to share, you can uh, uh, put the, the, the question on the chat. Or in, 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 if there is anyone watching from Facebook, your questions there, Angela will be keeping an eye on Facebook. And we are going to relate those questions to Jairo as well. When Jairo finishes the presentation, you can feel free to unmute your microphones, raise your hand or you call my attention. I will be moderating the conversation to, to give you all a chance to speak. This event is being uh, recorded and, uh, and will be shared on VLAC's YouTube channel. And we are also live streaming to our Facebook page. So uh, feel free to keep your camera off if you don't want to, to be recorded. And in, a, in any case, you know that these recordings will be, a, we will share later on the, the links to, to YouTube. So you can share the, the recording of this talk to, to anyone that you think might be interested in one. I also want to acknowledge the support, the support of Canadian Heritage and BC Arts Council for our programming series. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight because this talk was supposed to happen a couple of months ago, but we can now finally bring it back to you on this fascinating subject of muralism and indigenism. So I'm excited to introduce you to Jairo Salazar, who has an MA in Art History from the University of North Texas. His background includes teaching modern, contemporary, and Latin American art history courses in Colombia, the United States, and currently here in Canada. His academic research is devoted to the dialogues between war, catastrophe, and trauma in contemporary art. He now works as an art history instructor at Coquitlam College and collaborates as a guest lecturer for Mobile Art School in Vancouver. He has been presented the series of art talks with Vlack for uh, many months now, so you can expect to see more of Jairo in the future. So welcome, Jairo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the third, I believe, in the series of art talks. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Lily, uh, Angela, and everybody in the name of uh, the Vancouver Latin American Cultural Center 
um, for organizing these events and also for the acknowledgement that you made at the beginning of the talk, especially because it corresponds a lot with what we will discuss today. And particularly in light of our recent events that here in BC we'll know in the it's pretty, it's pretty frightening and sad to think about it, but, it, but it's also important to, to acknowledge, to recognize, and to remember where we are and where, uh, who the belongers of, of these lands are. So I'm going to share a screen with you, and I'm going to start my presentation. And um, so, I, deci I decided to title, title the presentation as um, Muralism, Indigenism, and Social Realism, Pride and Prejudice, because it seems to me that as much as there are benefits or great things about uh, muralism and the muralist movement, there were a lot of things that when looking in retrospective, we will need to revisit and we will probably need to, to question. So something that we did in the previous, uh, I believe in the previous two art talks that worked really well to kind of break the ice was to start with a, with a breakout room question. Now, today we are only eight, um, counting Lily and counting Angela. So I figured instead of going into breakout rooms, I can just uh, ask you this question uh, openly and I can give you some time to think about um, your answers. So you can either use the chat or you can raise your hand and use the microphone. And the first question that I wanted to ask you is what are some of the elements that make murals stand out as, a, as an art media or that make murals, uh, mural paintings different from other type of painted media, like any type of easel painting, right? Oil painting, tempera, etc. So I guess take your time, think about the question. I will probably give you what, I don't know, three, four or five minutes. Um, and share your answers. I hope you can share your answers, okay? So I will leave you, I'm going to just hide my camera temporarily so you can think about your, um, um, your, your answers and you can share them with me, okay? So see you in a bit. And as a clue, just to give you uh, some tips, um, on the right, you have a mural by David Alfaro Siqueiros. And on the left, you have a painting by a Peruvian painter, Jose Sabogal. So just to give you some illustrated uh, ideas for your answers.
All right. We are getting pretty interesting stuff here. So I'm going to start reading for those of you who don't have access to the chat or maybe for those of you who are connected on Facebook because I know that this is being live streamed on Facebook as well. Um, Michelle says, I think that they are painting on a large scale, on a large public surface like a building. That's one. So murals are expected to be public, okay? Um, host says the large format. So kind of corresponds to Michelle's idea, right? They happen to be on large um, monumental spaces, if the case, for everybody to see. Uh, and usually they are made in human scale, which is also very important to to mention, many times commissioned by government or public institutions, huge component. And you will remember why at the end of the presentation, murals are commissioned by governments or by institutions. They always happen as part of commissions, usually. Lois, hello, Lois, you say, one feature is that they utilize a grand scale, they offer a spectacle for the viewer in the public place, in the public space. I like that. Murals act as spectacles. So murals are intended to communicate, to inform something. And if they are commissioned by the government, murals have a strong political component. Michelle says, I think that in order for a mural to be considered a mural, it has to be grand scale. Host says they usually depict a scene, tell a story depicting people, objects, places. So they have a narrative, important as well. PBN says murals are large paintings on a wall or ceiling, generally quite large. Lewis continues utilizing the large scale. They can include elaborate tableaus for people demonstrating actions in public. People, another important component. Murals usually don't monumentalize one figure. Murals are about the masses, are about people. Now, the host is asking, are paintings on a ceiling also called mural paintings? I don't know if anybody has an idea. What do you think? If anybody wants to unmute or type an answer on the chat, are paintings on a ceiling also called murals? I, I have a theory. Uh-huh. Okay. Michelle? I, um, so mural, I think of the word uh, muro in Spanish that means wall. Wall. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if the, I, su I suspect that the word mural is derived from that word. Um, therefore, I don't think I think a, a ceiling mural would be called something different, but I don't know why. What? Fresco painting. Okay, uh, something important about murals or wall painting is that murals, as somebody suggested on the chat, are, are intended to be massive, to be public, to be easily accessible. When we think about a ceiling, somehow we think about private space. I'm not suggesting that all murals have to be in open spaces. Some murals that we will see today happen to be in closed spaces, in schools, in institutions. But the axis and also the, how do you call it? The point of view, the expected point of view of the spectator is, uh, is planned to be at, how do you call it? Uh, at the spectator's horizon line, if you want to call it that way. So it's at your distance instead of having you to, uh, to make an effort to look up at the ceiling. Also because of something very important. If murals are intended to be democratic, are intended to, um, to identify um, a group in society, looking up to the ceiling has a connotation of authority. And you don't want that, right? You don't want that for a mural that is expected to be public and that is expected to be democratic. At eye level, thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, all right, 
Thank you for your participation. That was the introduction. So I'm going to start the presentation now. And remember, if you have comments or questions, leave them on the chat, raise your hand, and we will have 30 minutes at the end of the presentation to, um, to participate, to have an open participation. And by the way, I will be asking some questions in the meantime anyway. So there might be the possibility that you will participate as I keep speaking. Before I forget, I know there are difference, huge, between a wall painting and any other sorts of uh, easel painting. And I think nobody wrote this. Um, wall paintings are not mobile and therefore are not tradable. If we think of the history of art, the very beginnings, of any artistic expression, they were taking place in, in walls, in churches, in, in caves, in houses, in private houses. So art was not a commodity, art was not tradable, was not mobile. With the introduction of easel painting, canvases, uh, retablos, and that sort of formats, painting became also a commodity. Painting became something that you could transport anywhere. So that's another difference of world painting as well, just to, to finish with that note. What is the purpose of a mural? Purpose of a mural is to educate and to instruct the masses by nurturing feelings such as pride, union, and national belonging with the purpose to strengthen a more homogeneous idea of nation. Oops, I apologize for that. Also, murals help to create a collective imaginary of national character propelled by an official um, program of politics or uh, by the state. So keep in mind that in the context of Mexico, murals were commissioned by the government, by the Secretary of Education. His name was Jose Vasconcelos. Vasconcelos' purpose was to embrace and to, to ask painters to reinterpret elements that integrated traditions rooted in Mexico's pre-Hispanic past and culture without disregarding the affections and transformations faced as a consequence or because of the colony. Here, nationalism functions as an ideology, as a philosophy, as a political theory. But more than that, the exacerbated nationalistic feeling help to create a mental structure, a collective cohesiveness that guaranteed common ways of thinking and shared the same sense of national pride. Who were the muralistas? Well, when Vasconcelos got into power, when he was appointed as Minister of Education, he contacted three of the most important painters at the moment in Mexico, Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and um, Jose Clemente Orozco. They were called Los Tres Grandes, the three great men. That gives you an idea. Let's start with Rivera, just some quick facts about his life. He was born in 1886 in Guanajuato. Back then, around the late 19th century, Mexico was ruled by Porfirio Diaz, a ruthless dictator in a ruthless dictatorship known as the Porfiriato. Rivera's family moves to Mexico in 1892. And there he starts his academic education at the Academia de San Carlos, one of the most traditional artistic institutions in Mexico. 
In 1906, the Mexican government grants him a scholarship to travel to Europe. He is trained in Spain and France between 1906 and 1908. And while in Paris, he is a first-hand witness of the emergence and consolidation of two movements that determine the destiny of modern art in Europe and in North America. Those were Cubism, he personally met and worked with Picasso and with Braque, and uh, Fauvism as well. I think that he met Matisse briefly. In 1910, he makes a brief visit to Mexico. And shortly after his visit, what happens in 1910? The Mexican Revolution. Diego did not leave the revolution. And this is an important fact. Diego fled again when he realized that the revolution was about to erupt. In 1920, after a visit to Italy, he gets in close contact and he learns from the artworks of the Renaissance masters, such as Giotto, uh, Paolo Uccello, Piero della Francesca, amongst others. And that's how he got to know the medium of fresco painting. Also in 1920, he travels back to Mexico after getting the call by Vasconcelos. By then, Vasconcelos was the dean of the Universidad Autónoma de México. And uh, after Vasconcelos was appointed as new secretary of public education, and during the presidency of Álvaro Obregón, Rivera decides to stay in Mexico for good. This is Rivera at his studio in Paris, or actually this is in Mexico, but there is a very similar picture of Picasso, who was an avid collector of African masks in his studio in Paris. So you can see the resemblances and you can get an idea of the interests between one and the other. Here, we see what was Vasconcelos' plan. Vasconcelos' plan was to, situa to situate the indigenous at the center of a new history of Mexico that began with the revolution. And Rivera stated about this fresco, blend, I want to blend the abstract theme with the subject matter. I make direct allusion by the inclusion of selected elements representative of our race, plus their placement and hierarchy within the composition. From the archetypical autochthonous kind to the Castellano, also considering the Mestizo. And in the central wall, there is a semicircle, a contoured shape by the rainbow, and in its axis, the unique light the Luz Una. The irony with murals like this is that Rivera was an academically trained painter. Rivera got the idea of going back to the roots because of the primitivists and avant-garde artists formed in Europe. And he took the opportunity to incorporate those primitivistic ideas of the avant-garde into the new program um, stated by Vasconcelos in Mexico. So the question is how to claim authority to visualize a utopian past, present, and future by using the same tools and the same training of the colonial past? The image of the indigenous acts as a surrogate of the Christian icon. What changes is the protagonist, but not the depth of the overall message. Religion and Catholic meanings, the father, the mother, Adam and Eve, the classical ideas of beauty so entrenched in Western thought prevail and remain intact. In fact, uh, there is a writer, there is a great book that uh, I wish you could um, 
you could check out um, by Edward Lucy Smith, Latin American art of the 20th century. Edward Lucy Smith states, I open quote here, that Rivera's aims were to speak directly to the Mexican people. And in order to achieve that, he had to abandon much of what was typical of modern art, at least in formal terms. Don't forget that. Don't forget that Rivera was part of Cubism. Rivera had defined another way of understanding a space, of understanding the figure in the pictorial plane. And yet Rivera went back to figuration, went back to resemblance, and went back to a type of depiction of the human body that fits or that is suitable to academic classical standards, European standards. Now, our next guy, Jose Clemente Orozco, was born in Guadalajara. His early work was particularly influenced by the 19th century lithographs of Jose Guadalupe Posada, Julio Ruelas, and the painter uh, known as Dr. Atl. He also received influence from the German expressionist movements so prevailing back then. And we see on the center the way Orozco presents La Malinche. And the story of La Malinche is the story of the what, what Mexicans understand as the Mexican if, the, the traitor, the sinner. Uh, a kind of uh, Mary Magdalene in a way that betrayed uh, her people because, um, because she was presumably the lover of Cortes, the conquistador. So we see Cortes and La Malinche over the defeated race below them. As early as 1912, thank you, um, Lily, for, for copying the, the book. That's wonderful. Um, as early as 1912, Orozco was working for different newsprint media, sketching for newspapers, magazines, and as a cartoonist. His most persistent subjects were prostitutes, gangsters, or members of the upper classes. The problem with uh, Orozco's style for, for, the, for the spirit and for the taste of the era is that the cartoonish is satirical, is whimsical, uh, has a mocking nature, and does not fit with the interest of the officialism into commissioning mural paintings. Somebody on the chat said that murals um, are official or governmental or institutional commissions. And if you get a commission, you don't want to be questioning or criticizing the status quo. You want to respond to what the status quo is expecting from you, okay? Around 1920, He's contacted by the Secretary of Education, Vasconcelos, to work along with Rivera at the Escuela Nacional Preparatoria. The Escuela Nacional Preparatoria is probably the only place that I can think of that has the three uh, grandes, the three great painters, the three muralistas in the same space. As far as, I, as, far as I'm concerned, I might be wrong. Um, murals like this, like the rich people, stirred a lot of controversy and negative responses from the general public as they were considered sketchy, not serious, vulgar, vulgar um, ordinary, and they were criticized for not reflecting the true history and dignity of Mexican people. This is key because it demonstrates that the expected function of murals was to create a collective sense of national pride. Murals were not perceived 
as an opportunity for artists to explore their inner personal interests and opinions. Instead, murals were expected to repeat a preconceived formula, regardless of the painter. Painters were expected to follow certain rules and particular expectations, particular interests to speak well of the official government. The negative reaction, by the way, from students and from academics was so strong that, o that um, Orozco was laid off in 1924 from the public commissions to create murals. He will be called back later on, you know, probably they felt bad. They realized that he was way too talented to let him go to rejoin the project after a while. Now, what does that tell you about the spirit of the time? It's telling you, what this is telling us is that people were in search of a national identity and what a better way in a similar fashion with what was happening in, in Russia after the Russian revolution, what a great way to establish a collective sense of national identity than by using images. Now, the question is, how do you, what authority do you have to create a sense of national identity through the use of images and through the visualization of a past that was still, um, that was still confusing, that was still um, in dispute, if you will. Now, if you look at this, section of the fresco mural at the Antiguo Colegio San Ildefonso, we see again what is happening with the use of poses that resemble Christian icons. In this case, I don't need to say it, it seems pretty obvious that the defeated revolutionary, that the defeated soldier emulates the classical Christian model of the Christ in the cross. So the colonial past is still there. It's still like a reminiscence, like, um, like, um, like a path, like, um, like a fingertip that, that stays there, that continues perpetually. Okay, the anatomy and the body poses emulate classical models, models. And something that also fascinates me about these murals is the lack of context the lack of territory, which is something that we will discuss later as well. The faceless indigenous is something also prevailing in Orozco's paintings. The anonymity of these figures, by the way, is not a symbol for collective or universal collaboration, the spirit of El Pueblo, but instead the anonymity suggests the lack of importance of the same, the lack of importance of those who are portrayed. They all look alike. They all seem the same. And not only is this problematic, I suggest, but also counterproductive. In fact, it is more dangerous because it kind of causes racial biases, misrepresentations, and stereotypes. You probably, and I hear this all the time as a Latino myself, uh, the type of um, cultural stereotypes that go around, all Latinos struggle, all Latinos are poor, all Latinos are violent, all Latinos are dramatic, they suffer, they are in a constant class with an opposing force. And in this particular fresco, we see that struggle with the past, with the present, and with the future. The subjects seem to be moving forward, but their gaze, their attention is leaning backwards. They are turning their backs to the past, like, um, like, a, like the biblical story of the, I forgot the name, the woman, uh, I believe it's Ruth, that looks back and turns into a statue of salt because she can't move forward. Um, so it's a timeline 
between the time depicted in the mural and the time of us as spectators. A step into the present, a step forward into the present, but a leap into the past. Why? The background space resembles the past, the times gone, the destruction of the old order. But if the old order is what we want to, to, to supersede, what we want to overcome, why are these two individuals still looking at the old order? Do they miss it? We don't know. I will leave that question up to you. So it seems as though they are stuck in an eternal present. They appear between yesterday and today. And the future is us. The future is the viewer. The future is the spectator. But they haven't reached that future yet. So the lack of facial features also corresponds to what I mentioned before. No identities, just bodies just workers, people struggling, people uh, trying to make a living out of tragedy. Orozco traveled around 1927 to Europe. Yet one more example of what I call artistic uh, mestizaje. And in Europe became particularly impressed by the works of the Italian Renaissance masters, especially um, Michelangelo's frescoes as the Sistine Chapel. Now that we were talking about ceiling frescoes, he was uh, flabbergasted by the artworks of um, um, Michelangelo. So it was just a matter of time for a shift in his artistic style. And you kind of feel it here in these late frescoes of the late 1930s. On the left, we see the Angel of Justice with a conquistador that looks like, um, kind of like an Iron Man, right? Kind of like a Robocop type of guy. He seems like a machine. So in a way, what he's suggesting is that the, mach the machine era, the industrial era, the era of progress uh, became the era of, um, became the new, the new colonizer, the new conquistador. The machine era is the new conquistador, is the new colonizer. And on the right, we see a Franciscan monk. And to me, the Franciscan monk seems authoritarian. Instead of questioning the labor of the colonizer, it seems as though the colonizer appeared as a hero and the mestizo or the indio appears as a victim. So it's sending some mixed messages about what the intentionality of these murals were all about. And no wonder why it steered so much controversy, particularly amongst the students, young students in Mexico who did not feel identified with many of these artistic approaches. Now, his focus is less ethnic, less indigenista, if uh, I may use the word, than, than the approaches of Rivera. Now, let's move to the last guy. We could spend an entire semester talking about these murals. So I am not that interested in focusing on each and every single detail, but I will try to look more at the big picture and at the issues that are extracted from all these uh, different examples that we're going to look at today. Siqueiros was born in 1896 in Chihuahua. He studied fine arts at the Academia San Carlos in Mexico City, and then joined the army to fight in the Civil War. In 1919, he received an art grant that once again enabled him, guess what? To travel to Europe. And in Europe, while in Europe, he met uh, Diego Rivera. 1922, after the revolution, he returned to Mexico after it was safe to do so. He worked along with Rivera and Orozco in, at the Escuela Nacional Preparatoria and the murals that were commissioned for those spaces. Siqueiros was an interesting character. He believed that the art of Mexico was the biggest and most glorious spiritual manifestation of the world. 
He also claimed that indig the indigenous tradition as the best of all, the best of all. So we see here a mixture of identity combined with nationalism, a strict, extreme, radical nationalism. He rejected the practice of easel painting and he aligned with an art of propaganda suited with the ideological interests of the government. What troubles me about Cicadus's approach is that it seems that he's making a use of um, cultural appropriation and misrepresentation. Cicadus even stated the art of the natives, it's the best, precisely because of its popular nature that defies and contravenes the tyranny of the bourgeois, of the bourgeois sense of individualism, end of quote. But we will have to ask ourselves, who were Rivera, Siqueiros, and Orozco in their individual and in their artistic persona? to talk about indigenous identity and dignity. How are their actions dignifying the indigenous experience? So in a way they are, all of them are taking a messianic attitude, the savior, the Messiah. I give voice to the oppressed and I visualize the history of those denied and all the same kind of discourse that we have heard so many times about artists claiming themselves as the voice of those misrepresented or underrepresented. Now, something important to mention, none of the Mexican muralists we have discussed so far engaged with the issue of the territory and with the context where the portrait belong. All we see are bodies struggling. In the case of cicadas, we do see faces, but they are almost standardized, repetitive, rhythmic, like, like a mold, you know, like a, yeah, like a cast repeated once over and over and over again. And also the muralist the idea of el muralista is a personification of the worker, of the laborer, of the obrero, but also the macho, the construction worker, the engineer, the male, the empowered male, so um, imbricated, so entrenched in Mexican culture. Reason why we can understand how Mexican muralism closed the door for women. And I don't need to tell you the story of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo because you probably are familiar with it. And you know how troublesome it was for Frida to try to get close to what Diego was doing with the murals. Reason why Frida Kahlo or uh, Remedios Baro never engaged with the muralistas because the muralismo was a movement for, for machos, for machotes, hmm? for men. In the Revolutionaries, 1937, Siqueiros is exhausted and disappointed by the political and social situation in his natal Mexico. And he decides to flee to America, to the United States. In California, uh, at the, I don't know how to pronounce that, the Schoenlard School of Arts, I believe is how it's called. He experiments with new media, such as spray paint and pyroxylene. And pyroxylene is a type of paint used for um, painting, for coating cars, similar to Duco, similar to Duco paint. In 1936, before returning to Mexico, he also traveled to New York and led a group of young artists keen in experimenting with new media. And amongst those artists, there was um, Arshail Gorky and Jackson Pollock. But hey, Cicadas rejected easel painting and rejected the bourgeoisie, but he lived in New York for a while and 
his patrons were quite important people in the art market in New York City. Anyway, this is one of the murals that interest me the most about Cicados because finally, after traveling back and forth, after all his disappointments and whatnot, he finally decides to move back to Mexico and stay there until he, until he died, I believe. What I like about this mural is that he integrated two disciplines. He integrated painting and he integrated a sculpture. So the mural acts as um, the mural acts as a functional mural in a way. And what I mean by functional is that the mural is not independent. It's not an independent reality or an independent entity from the building. The mural intertwines with the presence of the building, even the abstractions, which is what I was going to say as well, the mixture of the abstraction and the figurative sort of continues and it's not interrupted by the groundbreaking, by the cutting edge structure and plasticity of the building. So what can we say by now before I move to Gorman? Um, in Rivera, we find a kind of indigenism that focuses on ethnicity. In Orozco, we find a concern with social struggle and inequality. In Cicados, we find a concern with revolutionary ideas, kind of a Marxist idea that the revolution is always taking place and it's always permanent. And also with the social condition, kind of a social stratification for society. Speaking of mural and architecture, um, my favorite, if you ask me, is Juan O'Gorman's Our Colonial Past. For many reasons. Once again, we see the integration of the image with the building. So the image coexists with the presence of the building. And we forget about the, the cold, um, sort of um, lifeless presence of these rationalistic, uh, functionalist buildings. And instead we think of the building as a living entity, but we also think of the building and we can connect the imagery of the building with pre-Hispanic imagery. So I might be contradicting myself here, and I understand that, but I think that the issue with the other muralists is that the other muralists uh, give themselves way too much credit into visualizing a reality that did not belong to them. In this case, Gorman is using symbols, symbolism, abstraction combined with figuration. And two worlds, two different ways of thinking that converge in the same image. The world of vision, the world of figuration, the world of order, and the world of mysticism. Representation and abstraction in a functional space. Now, some things to consider before we go into indigenism and social realism. And time flies. I know that I am supposed to be done soon for questions and answers, but um, I will try to move on. Um, so in a nutshell, indigenism refers to paintings produced between the 1920s and 1930s as a consequence of the Mexican Revolution and with the influence, with the rediscovery and the revalorization of the cultures and the indigenous traditions. And indigenism refers to the use of subjects belonging to indigenous realities in literature, in arts, and that are frequently organized with a sense of social protest. 
So the difference between indigenism and social realism is that in social realism, you don't necessarily have to be engaged with the figure of the Indio or the Mestizo. You can simply talk about the working classes and the struggles of the working classes. And the difference between indigenism and muralism is that in indigenism, you bring the ideals of the muralistas into um, portable easel paintings, okay? Oil paintings, retablos, and whatnot. Some conflicting aspects to consider about this Latin American movement of indigenism and social realism. The revolution became a style. <laughs> the revolution won't be televised, as the song said. What this means is that muralism, as a pure Mexican search for identity and national pride, was decontextualized, was appropriated, and became a plastic search for a continental, if not a national identity. But national, each in their own niche, in their own place, in their own imaginary. So that created a distortion of the idea, lo Latino Americano as a unity. So also became uh, a possibility for Latin American artists, but a possibility that will eventually become constraining. Second issue, misrepresentation and instrumentalization. So the interest for the indigenous was more into the exoticized, orientalized, ethnicized curiosity. And I understand here um, orientalism or exoticism um, under the, the idea of Edward Said and the concept of orientalism uh, written by Edward Said to describe the fascination and exotic view of the West towards the East. Orientalism reflects European imperialism and colonialism. It enriches a sense of false superiority an exoticism that places the non-Western as the other. So it creates a game of binaries, you name them, man, woman, straight, gay, rich, poor, beautiful, ugly, good, bad, white, black, Espanol, indígena, um, Christian, Muslim, you name them, okay? All this game of binaries that create the one in detriment of the other. So the other is the outrank, outrank opposite of the one. Nationalism, was it an achievement or a creative constraint? So in quite a naive way, artists and academics thought that the Latin American identity was homogeneous without gray areas, without a place for difference and dissent. This led to a confusing and at times radical attitude that didn't even know how to define the indigenous for the pre-Hispanic, but also created other sorts of assumptions that led to a sectarian, victimist, subordinate and enclosed approach to the world and hence to modernity in art. And that did not allow Latin American artists to think of their practices beyond their nationality or their race to explore other plastic possibilities. And finally, modernity seen not as a universal way of thinking that expands the horizons of knowledge, but as a local way of understanding reality. So it would be worth considering how possible is it to understand modernity, which is a problem and concept originated in Western thought, in terms of resistance and rejection of the culture and European values. And why do I say this? The biggest patrons, let me just move here, and art collectors of Latin American art in the 1920s and 1930s were Americans and Europeans. Rockefeller amongst others. The introduction of Latin American art to the, pub, to the general public in the world happened via an exhibit that took place at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1943. What this tells us, and I'm going to make a quick overview of uh, 
Latin American countries before I finish and I open the door for discussion, you can live in a state of permanent revolution. That's a utopia. In the case of Siqueiros on the left, the ethnic is kind of, kind of the main concern here, okay? He does insist on revealing social condition and struggle. The indigenous appear as subordinate, um, as a residue of modern society. And something that I don't like about Siqueiros painting on the left is that it appears dirty. So it communicates the idea that indigenous are also dirty, are, 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 are full of uh, dirt, are kind of like with these earthy values, I understand the intention of using earth colors as you know the mother earth and all that, but it's conveying a different thing as well. Okay, so it's orchestrating a different type of meaning, um, and it could also be argued that it has this has something to do with an unequal distribution of wealth and land. And again, we don't see the land here. The excuse for land are two cactuses that are very caricaturesque, are pretty mediocrely painted. There is no interest in the territory, okay? Now, if we look at Rivera's um, Day of Flowers, we see this geometrization of the, of the motif, um, and we see the contour and the anatomy of the figures that somehow reveal uh, a wish from Rivera to return to the type of cubist style that he had forgotten before. So what this is, what this is telling us is that this um, interest of Rivera simply stops at a high level of intellectualism and a formal, only an aesthetic admiration of the popular as a curiosity generalizing the figure of the indigenous, not really concerned with the realities and upheavals of these people. So it's kind of opportunistic, contradictory um, as well, because his political stand did not correspond with the type of patronage he was used to receiving. And in the case of Orozco, in the center, the mass, the crowd, okay? Collectivizing a cause might lead to a generalized stereotype. All Mexicans are alike, all Mexicans look the same, all Mexicans are humble, all Mexicans are workers, are lower middle class, campesinos, charros. Mexico is a sombrero, Mexico is uh, a hat, okay? So we got to be very careful again when it comes to thinking about how to represent what, what the academy imposed as the cultural order. And I say this in quote because I don't like that term. So I just want to make that statement very clear. What is my final thesis before we just look quickly at some examples in Latin America? My thesis is that the attempt to visualize and give material presence to the indigenous through artistic terms is not entirely detached from a misleading bias. Instead, it acts as a surrogate for what the colonial languages stood for as instituted visual vocabularies. In other words, here we are confronted by a subtle system of symbols rooted in the innermost Christian iconography, the cross, the mother, the virgin and the child, the father, the first man, Adam, and the sinner woman, Eve. And these icons are showcased now in a renewed way, but just with a veil, with a false veil of authenticity and fabricated national pride glued as in a way of a palimpsest of meanings, allusive only to an imaginary, perhaps non-existent, but highly exoticized past. 
I want to conclude with this quote that I try to translate. It's really hard to find translations of Marta Trava. And then I will open the discussion with a question that I have on a slide right after. This is the quote from a text on indigenism. And she was particularly talking about the Ecuadorian painter Osvaldo Guayasami in Problemas del Arte en Latinoamérica. Within all its formal and plastic possibilities, this Americanismo did not help in contributing to the development of new pictorial searches. Conversely, the regressive spirit and the insistence on expired conventions, conventions made extensive use, in the best of the scenarios, of a visual vocabulary previously explored by the European avant-garde movements to supposedly place it within a social con context suited to Latin American realities. In short, artists forcibly used a plastic language that was intended to refuse resemblance and perspectival, perspectival space in exchange of representing and keeping the figure, no matter at what cost. I want to ask you a question and we can start the participation here. Let's, let's take a minute to analyze this painting based on what we have seen today. What do you find different in this painting from the works that we saw before? And I will just leave the painting now. And you can raise your hand or use the chat, whatever, whatever you want. We're in participation section now. Anybody who wants to unmute yourself? Yeah, Michelle has, has some ideas. Michelle. Um, hi. Yeah, something that stands out to me in this painting compared to the other ones is the uh, what seems to be like eye contact. The, mm -hmm. it, it feels like, it, yeah, they're looking directly at, at the viewer. That's a huge point. Identity. But also pride behind that identity, okay? He feels comfortable in his own skin, in a way. Let's see, we have something on the chat. The figure is standing with pride, exactly. There is some kind of pride and some kind of individualized identity that was not seen in the Mexican muralistas that were all about collectivizing the experience of being a Mexican. Anything else? Hi, Jairo. It's Mo here. Hey, uh, Mohammed. Hi. Fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, Thank you. One thing that, I, that I'm seeing here is that the figure is not really performing anything for us. Like it, mm -hmm. uh, the figure is kind of standing uh, kind of on, its, on um, their own terms in a way, whereas I compare it to the, the, the uh, was it the friar, the Fran Franciscan? Uh, which I is agree. kind of like you're you're looking up at this figure, uh, and there's this it's like whole performative power relationship with the level of the perspective of the viewer. Mm -hmm. like, I uh, I agree. I I think something very important here is that he appears as the one who is dominating the scene and not as the dominated, not as the subordinate. So he's not responding to anybody except for himself. And I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on something. I'm surprised that nobody has commented on something that it seems pretty evident. I mean, it's not that evident, of course. I mean, we focus mainly on, on the figure, on the Barayok, on the, on the ruler. It's actually like a, like a major of that place. But there is something else. I was going to talk about the, the, the depth of feud because uh, w uh, in, in the previous works, we have that very shallow depth of feud. And, and here we have this first um, plane. I don't know how you say that, but uh, the, the figure is, is there in, the, in this first thing. And then there, there is this very wide distance in the background. Exactly. I you use the keyword and 
Michel also got it, the land. There is land in the background. So this is a painting about land possession, about mm -hmm. ownership, about territory. And I could spend another hour talking about the difference between territory, landscape, and, and land without the scape in between. But this is a conflicting image about somebody who claims to be the owner of that land, even though he's not the, the only owner. He's just, uh, he's like a, um, like a tenant of an owner who is a colonizer. So he has borrowed that land because uh, the distribution of lands for indigenous communities in Peru was, it's not that it was stolen, but in a way it was borrowed. So he didn't have entire ownership of that place. But here we see a landscape, we see a territory. And I think that's very important because it's a discussion that did not take place in none of our previous uh, representations, okay? So I want to comment on that as well. And finally, other question. So what's the difference between muralism, graffiti, and a street art. Ah, that's a tough one. I think we, we established at the beginning that uh, uh, murals are a, a usually uh, works that are commissioned by an organization, or by, which is not true for right. street art usually. Exactly. So or graffiti, which is kind usually, of like an individual's expression. And it's kind of spontaneous as well, right? It kind of happens, it erupts, right? Um, graffiti usually comes out of a general sense of discontent. And graffiti doesn't have the intention to, to be propagandistic which is something, and I'm, I go to Michelle's question, I apologize that I didn't address the question before, how much creative freedom did the artists have with this commission? And Michelle, I love the question because it reminds me of when I always think of the difference of what happened in the, in, in the Russian revolution with Malevich and the suprematists and the constructivists, and there is a great anecdote about it, Basically, when, when the revolution took place and when Stalinism came into power, Malevich told the constructivist artist, you know what, I'm out. Like, <laughs> Malevich said, I don't want to be part of this because when art is subjugated to the interest of the state, the artist loses freedom. Eventually you have to sell your soul to the devil. And that's what suprematism that, that's why I defend suprematism in the sense that Malevich didn't believe that art should have an agenda. And anytime you put a face on a painting, you have an agenda. Any kind of representation is a statement on power. Even if you are representing yourself, it doesn't matter because you are taking a stance about a, an element of tangible reality. But with abstraction, you're talking about symbols that can be universal or can, that can be appropriated by anybody at a certain period of time and can achieve different kinds of meanings, which is what happened with the famous black square on top of the, of the white canvas. A black square on a white canvas, what does it mean? Nothing and everything at the same time. So that's a problem with, with public commissions. And that's what opens the door to differentiate um, graffiti from street art. The, the, the term street art to me sounds kind of funny because street art is like, like a polished version of graffiti. Graffiti has always been criminalized. You know, Graffiti has always been seen as the consequence of vandalism, the consequence of uh, uh, crim uh, crime, the consequence of gangs. But that's a pretty discriminatory way of looking at graffiti because the origins of graffiti in cities like New York 
have to do with an expression that is spontaneously coming from marginal from historically marginalized societies. So it's a way to reclaim denied whites, negle neglected identities, places. That's why I have this example of what is happening in Bogota currently with the in Cali, in all in Colombia, overall with the with the protests against uh, the government because the government is not treating well their citizens and the government is sort of like uh, sponsoring police brutality. So people are rioting on the streets and protesting and people are taking power on their hands because they are desperate and they are taking over monuments and they are tearing apart the monuments to claim their land. This guy, Sebastián de Belarcázar was a conquistador, a colonizer, um, pretty terrible guy for, for the history of indigenous rights in Colombia. So with the protest, they decided to tear apart, to tear down the statue and use the, the space to, um, to create this mural, this public mural, okay? All right, we have a comment here. They all have a message, Martin, exactly. They all have a message as well. Now, something different between graffiti and murals or wall paintings is that, well, graffiti doesn't necessarily need to include a narrative or a story behind it. It can simply be a statement, a statement with words, sentences, um, or images, okay? But it's just, it's kind of a, it's more iconic than a mural. A mural, you have to explore it, you have to look here, you have to look there. So a mural works more as a painting in a way, in the narrative sense of the word. Um, whereas a graffiti is just, you just see it right there. And the other condition of the graffiti is the temporality of the medium. A graffiti is created not to, not to be way too permanent. It's kind of evanescent, elusive, endless, becomes kind of a palimpsest, right? People write over and over and over on the same place. I don't know if you happen to see here in the corner, you know, somebody writes and then the other person writes on top and so on. But anyway, I spoke way too much. Thank you. I don't know Let's if you have see, any uh, other I questions or comments. Angela has a question. Yes, uh, sorry, I have like a question regarding uh, uh, the muralism that were uh, commissioned. Like, um, I can understand artists didn't have like, uh, uh, like could express whatever they want, but how much was the government intervention? Like, is there any case that uh, it's like, is there any case that they could say, I didn't like this? Um, just going to stop the project or just supervise mean, it to the point. In Mexico? Yes, like, well, the big mur murals, because because if, like, if they're, they're paying for the painting and suddenly the artist somehow is not going the way they want, like, is there any case, like, the government just, like, uh, ended up? I am, I am not too documented on an exact case of censorship or, but I do know that all of them had disagreements amongst each other and with, with the ministry and with the government. And I think I mentioned the case of uh, Orozco. Mm -hmm. He was kicked out. <laughs> he was kicked out of the, of, the, of the project. Now, that in Mexico, in the US, there was a huge case. I, I'm glad that I brought it. I, I, I didn't have the time to talk about this today, but the famous um, Rockefeller Center mural. So Rivera was commissioned to create a mural at Rockefeller Center in New York. And everything was all right. Mural is awesome. And suddenly, and the mural was about, you know, the workers and the importance of the industry and modernity and the different classes and whatnot. But then Rivera included the face of this guy. You know who that guy is? Yeah. Yeah. 
Who is that guy? It's Lenin. Yes, Vladimir Lenin. And Rockefeller, guy got so upset, he made the mural, like he made the mural, like the commission stopped right there. He ordered for the mural to be destroyed, to be demolished. So that's why the mural was translated, was transposed to, yeah, this is the one. No, wait, this is the Detroit industry. No, this is not the one. Um, in Mexico, I believe, I don't know if I have a copy of it. The one that is finally in Mexico. No, I didn't bring it. I didn't bring it. Jairo, when you can, Patricia Martin also has a, a question. Uh, and Michelle has a, a question in the chat. Yeah, hi, Jairo. Um, I was just wondering, because when you look at those murals the, the, in Mexico, I mean, you say that those were, uh, they, they, they were commissioned, but at the same time, I mean, I see a lot of criticism of, of, um, mm. of the society, of, uh, of the Industrial Revolution. You mm. know, I see a lot of different um, commentaries there that can be, that can be, um, they, 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 they give a message to the people, right? It's, it's a criticism of the society, right. the rich and the poor and the Industrial Revolution. And yeah, so. I, I think that proves one of the one of the points that i was trying to <clears throat> to make here in my conclusions um where is it you can't pretend to create an image of national identity by making everything homo homogeneous homogeneous, okay, by making, by making everything equal. Um, when, you, when you believe or when you think that you are giving a face to an entire country, you will always have a backlash. You will always have people saying, I don't feel represented by that. And that's the danger of using art for for nationalistic purposes. I think there is, there is a thin line that divides national pride from nationalism. The ism in national pride creates a blinding experience of your identity as member of a nation or as member of a state. And quoting Malevich again, when when you, when you leave it to the government, the purpose of constructing an idea of nation and not to the citizens, you end up having and dealing with all these sort of misrepresentations and misunderstandings. Um, I didn't want to talk about, I mean, because it's kind of, off topic, but many to me, and something that I have read extensively in other places, the problem with this type of approaches is that the Latino, the Latin American became kind of a standardized in different artistic expressions over the continent. And any artists, that decided, like Rufino Tamayo, artist that decided not to stick to what the muralistas wanted was intellectually prosecuted. Rufino Tamayo was destroyed by the muralistas and he had huge clashes with the muralistas because he was not interested in it. He was, he was uh, judged as a traitor because he was not concerned with the identity of his country. And does that mean that in order to be Mexican, he had to be wearing the flag everywhere he goes and he had to be wearing a poncho and a sombrero? No. And that is also a lesson for artists. So in order to be, and I think that I spoke about this before as well in, in, my, in my first talk, uh, the case of Gabriel Orozco, a contemporary artist 
anywhere he goes, the first question is, you as a Mexican are incorporating your experience as a Mexican in your artwork? And he says, no, I am an artist, but I am not speaking about Mexico. So why do I feel obliged to talk about Mexico anytime I create something? So I know that I am kind of <laughs> steering away from your original question, but I guess my point is, it's not good for artists, it's not good for governments to create a unified idea of nation. Because the first step to guarantee national pride is to understand diversity, to understand gray areas, you know, to understand also the possibility of having um, uh, disagreements. Hi, having different points of view. Okay. I'm sorry, I am the, the time police here <laughs> and we are approaching the, the end of the, of the talk. Uh, Vivian uh, said on the chat that that mural that you are trying to locate is at the uh, Bellas Bell Artes in, in Mexico. Uh, Bellas Artes in Mexico yes. City, that's right. Thank you. So uh, I, we are approaching the, the, the end. I don't think we're going to have time. I have a, a couple of uh, announcements to make. So just my, my quick closing remarks. So uh, thanks, Jairo, so much. This was exciting and, and we certainly learned so much. Thank you for bringing so many images. It was really <laughs> great to, to see them all, even Portinari. And I'm glad that you included a Brazilian there. <laughs> uh, thank you all for taking the time uh, to be here with us tonight, uh, despite the gorgeous weather out there. Uh, thank you for sharing the time here with us. The, the video recording of this event will be available on our YouTube channel in, in a few days. We are putting the link on the, on the chat for the channel. So if you want to share this talk or if you want to, to, to take a look at it again, uh, you can go there. It so, was also streamed to our Facebook page. So that's another place where you can you know, watch again or, or share. Uh, uh, Angel is also like we're gonna have lots of links in the chat right now. I, I when we we uh, so we are putting the links to our social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, so you can also uh, sh um, follow us. Jairo's Instagram is on this slide that's on right now. But I would like to remind you that Vlack has two other events happening uh, 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 happening this month. Uh, on next Thursday, uh, June 24th at noon, we are going to be, maybe at noon it will be better during summer because people can take time off their, their lunch to, to be with us. Uh, so, so next Thursday, June 24th at noon, we have a tertulia. Uh, uh, we're gonna be discussing, it's called, uh, Que significa ser Afro Latinx? What does it mean to be Afro Latinx? It's going to be a discussion on the complexities of the Afro-Latin identity and its challenges and the importance of recognizing the African influence in, in Latin culture. But we think that's going to be a pretty exciting one. So join us next Thursday at noon. Also on Tuesday the 29th, we will have a conversation with visual artist Manuel Pinha uh, uh, Manuel Pinha is Cuban, uh, but uh, from Vancouver, and and the the conversation is going to be moderated by uh, Vlad's vice president and art historian uh, Miret Rodriguez. So that's that's on Tuesday the twenty nine at noon. We are also putting the link there for you. Both events are free, and, but seats seats are limited, so make sure to to register soon. And speaking about free events, we uh, Vlack is running a donation campaign right now. So if you uh, if you can and if you want to support what we do and help us keep events like this free or you know very affordable, it's an opportunity for you for you to support the the work we have been doing. The link to donations is also on the chat. So that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming. 